Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Eagle Bend Community Church. And what do you know, I have a couple of, annou of announcements first. In our community, there are about 50 to 100 people who have Parkinson's, including myself. And maybe you saw it in the Friday Blast. I'm trying to start a, a support group. So if you know anybody who has Parkinson's who would like to be part of the support group, please let me know. Thank you. Number two, Leroy, where are you? You won, you won your flight in the championship, didn't you? All right. Yeah. And sometimes very, very interesting things come out of uh, very unsuspecting events. Betty was sitting at the altar this morning, and she said, we ought to move the cross over to the right, left side over here because the cross has gotten in the way. She, what a great sermon title, The Cross, the cross is in the Way. The Cross is in the Way. <laughs> he's going to write a song. He's going to write a song, and he's going to do a sermon. Great title. I yeah. Know. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Right over there. The altar cross. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to Eagle Bend Community Church. It's so great to see so many of you. Uh, and we have, we have visitors, but they've been here before. And, gee, let's turn all the lights out so I can't see anything, but that's okay. So I'll, I'll have to put my glasses on. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, flowers this morning uh, with, are, is given by Joyce Trivieri uh, in loving memory of her husband. So thank you, Joyce, very much for doing that. Is Linda Kaminsky here? Well, we're not going to say happy birthday then. Heck with it. Okay. So we just move on. Okay. Today's the last day to sign up for the Bible study. So if you're interested in our Bible study, it's really wonderful. Uh, Debbie does a fantastic job. And she brings everything. It, there's no homework. She brings everything to you as, as, it, as it happens today. So uh, please sign up if you can. She's going to take the sign-up sheet with her today. So I hope you'll be able to do that. And it, the, this, it's going to be, we'll be meeting for our first meeting September the 12th at my home. Uh, 930 is coffee and conversation. 10 o'clock is the Bible study. And we go from 10 to 11. And she's very good about keeping us on time. So uh, that's really important to know. So, and the ladies' luncheon is September 26th. I have a sign-up sheet outside. And Linda Kaminsky is going to be doing her greatest story. And thank you, Nancy Abrell. Your story was really terrific. One of the things that she just gave me a boatload of things to say. But anyway, one of them was that when she met um, her husband, uh, whatever his name is, Fred. Yes, thank you. When she met, well, she was working in a hotel, and she said, you know, I was really happy working at the hotel, and then I met Fred. <laughs> and he's going, did you really say that? <laughs> well, you know, it was just in the middle of the conversation, you know, but 50 some odd years later, obviously, it has worked out very, very well. So thank you so much. But thank you very much, Nancy. That was really great. And, um, oh, I, I said that already. Joyce Trivieri. Oh, to, oh, yeah, flowers. If you would like to sign up for flowers, the, the uh, sign-up sheet is in, in, on the table again. So uh, we really appreciate, we really appreciate the fact that you do bring flowers. It's really, really wonderful, and it really, and it saves the church a lot of money, you know, for doing that as well. It doesn't matter what you bring. So I, I have a message from Bernadette, too. Bernadette has gone from Bernadette 3 to Bernadette 2. Um, so Bernadette 1 is Bernadette Shook, and now she's Bernadette 2. Uh, her daughter, Sarah, her father-in-law had a long illness with type 1 diabetes and passed away Saturday morning. Please pray for the family and comfort them uh, because every, he was a very beloved person and everyone loved him so much. So that was very sad. Thank you for telling me that. And I have a note from Carol Tracy. And it says, H-E-B Community Church, thank you for thinking of me during this difficult time. Her, remember, her sister passed away. Your words, cards, and prayers were so kind and very, very much appreciated. My sister is at peace and with God in heaven. Again, I thank everyone for their condolences. Carol Tracy, thank you very, very much. And um, that's it. Wow, that's it. 
can't believe that. Okay. dark up here. <laughs> well, following in the tradition of my big sister, Barbara McKean, a um, little anecdote. A Sunday school teacher one Sunday was trying to teach her class the difference between good and bad and right and wrong. And uh, she said, all right, let's uh, have an example. If I were to put my, man, my hand in a man's pocket and take out his billfold with his money, what would I be? Little Johnny popped up, he said, his wife. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Amen. And for our first hymn, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Don't stand.
us pray. Lord, today and every day, we worship you. We bless you for creating us in your image. We thank you that after we fell away from you in sin, you did not leave us in our sin, but you came to us in Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and was resurrected for our salvation. We rejoice that you then brought him to sit at your right hand, now with you. We can now enjoy you forever. As we await his coming again, receive this, our worship, in the strong and holy name of Jesus. Amen. I know how to read Braille. I can't see here either. Today's scripture, James 1, 2 through 8. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, unstable in all he does. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. And our next hymn is Count Your Blessings.
You know, sometimes you pray before the meal. Jesus prayed after the meal. I think that's the best way to do it. That way you know if you should say, Lord, thank you that we had that, or help us never experience that again. <laughs> I think it's good praying. Well, let me pray for that offering. Lord, we don't count our blessings enough. We're often not grateful enough. And your mercies are new every morning. We wake up due to the blood of Christ with a clean slate every day, thankful for 1 John 1, 9, that we don't have to go all the way back to baby steps, but that we can repent right where we are and keep walking the path of life. So with these offerings, would you bless, would you expand the reach of this church through these gifts? May you bless the hearts that have broken the strings that hold us so tightly to our finances and that have given. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.
Thank you, choir. We'll see if it, yeah, there you go. Sorry, it's being contrary. Let me pray. We'll jump in. Lord Jesus, we do need wisdom. That's what we're talking about today. We need wisdom. But we need to trust you that it works. So help us with that as we discuss. Help us trust you that your wisdom is better than our plans and our ideas. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Um, I want to reread the first part of this passage, and it may be a different translation. But, count it all joy, my brother. So what do we know so far? Class. What do we know? Who are we talking to? Christians. When you see brothers, sisters, Christians. Okay? So, he's talking to the church. He's talking to some believers. And he's going to lay it out here for him. And I kind of think of this first half as our perspective, and the second half as God's perspective. Okay? I'll show you what I mean. Count it all joy. Consider it joy. Think about joy. When you face trials, testing, difficulties, frustrations of all kinds, fill in the blank. You want to fill in? Anybody else want to fill in any other blanks? Taxes, health. Gas prices, stress, thank you. Traffic, relatives, (laughs) the person sitting next to you. I get it. Sorry, I'm stirring the pot for lunch. I've never seen this phrase. I've been preaching a while, a few decades. I've never seen this phrase. Or it translated this way, for you know. So he's writing to Christians, and he's saying, you already know this part. (laughs) We're just not sure we're doing it. For you know, I mean, you know the testing of your faith, the pressure on your faith, the opportunities to exercise your faith, the opportunities to strengthen your faith, the opportunity to walk away from your faith. You know what these do. You know what makes you stronger. You know it makes you endure better. You know it develops perseverance. You know it makes you more steadfast. So, get, okay, those are three nice words. Endurance, perseverance, steadfast. Good churchy Sunday school words. Give me the real words. What's the everyday word for those things? Don't give up at this. <laughs> what else? Grind? Grit? Just do it. So James is telling the church and telling us, reminding us, you guys already know this. You know that when difficult things happen, it's just there to make you stronger. It's an opportunity to get stronger. Editorial comment. Why do we pout about it? Why do we get frustrated? Things aren't going our way. But here's what it translates to. I don't want to grow. I don't want to grow up. I don't want to develop my faith. I don't want to know God better. How many of you would say in your darkest times, in your scarcest times, when your faith was all that you had to hold on to, that you knew Him best, that you grew the most? Yeah, you're all shaking your heads yes. Now, why do we get frustrated when it happens? You know why? Because life's moving too fast, and we don't take the time to get perspective, to slow down. Count your many blessings. I always picture this Sunday school teacher doing this to the little children, you know, count your many blessings. And even the secular world has picked up on how gratitude shapes your brain. It rewires. It actually reshapes the lobes in your brain. And so they're going to have you write three gratitudes per day. Well, the Christians have been doing this for centuries, or at least we should have been. James is saying it should be joy. 
Now, logically speaking, logically thinking, is that a little psychotic? When it hits the fan, I'm supposed to celebrate? Hmm. When I'm in pain, do I celebrate? No, that would be psychotic. Understanding what that can do to my faith and my relationship with the Lord. Now, James is making an assumption that that is the goal of our lives. That is the trajectory of our lives. Pleasing the Lord, growing in the Lord. If that's not the trajectory of your life and you call yourself a believer, we need to get some realignment. You know, GPS works like this. It's realigning all the time. It's realigning, it's realigning, it's realigning. It doesn't do it and then take, a, take an hour off and you're like, you know, out in Bennett going, hey, where are the directions? It's constant. Well, that should be our attentiveness to the Lord. Constant. Oh, I got off a little bit. I thought I was, I thought I was doing some stuff here. Boy, was I doing some stuff. I was really screwing it up. I thought I knew better than the Lord. We could stop and give testimony about that till the afternoon, couldn't we? Yeah, I see your faces. For you know, so he, I like this. You already know this part. Now, I used to give personality tests to people and, and did a lot of premarital and postmarital counseling with trained marriage mentors, which is ironic because I'm single now. Um, Work for everybody else, not for me, right? I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, you got to laugh, right? You got to laugh. Everybody wanted to find out things about their personality. They were so interested to see the results. Who am I? What am I like? If you don't know what you're like after all this time, something's wrong. But they still wanted to know. Okay, t- t- tell us what kind of couple we are. You don't know? You fight a lot, you fight a little. There's a real intrigue that we're going to find out something else about ourselves. It's anticipation. Larry, you play many golf tournaments where they don't keep score? Nope. How many how many go out with a group and just play for fun? Yeah. She's the competitive one, right? (laughs) Don't play board games with Betty. Yeah, <laughs> three-inch putt's not a gimme. You got you to put it in the hole. <laughs> um, PGA rules. Why is that such a big deal? Does it just mean you're competitive, not competitive? We keep score, whether we want to admit it or not, in life. We keep score about how we're doing. We look at our bank account. Look at our visa bills. It's a score. How are we doing? Mary was spending less than we have in the bank, right? He's saying, you know that when these hard things come, it's going to give you opportunity to show and to reveal some things about yourself. And some of us go, yes, that's awesome. And some of us go, oh, crap. Can I say crap in church? Maybe not. Huh? Oh, it's a dice game. Okay. Um, some of us will be excited to see what we learn. Some of us will feel exposed. If you're a person who believes that you're self-made and you did it yourself without Jesus, you will feel exposed. Just call them spade a spade. Now, we talk about this a lot. If God already knows, and we already know, how is it we get to the point where we think we know and He doesn't know? Why come in clean with God about where we are? Does that feel like exposure? But it does. That's why Adam and Eve hid, right? And we've been trying to sew fig leaves together in our lives to cover it up ever since. Building our own little kingdom. For you know the testing of your faith produces endurance, steadfastness. Now, let that grittiness, let that stick let 
Let that perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The interesting word on the full effect. Some of your versions, the NIV, will typically say, um, let it finish its work. And I want to make a parallel. It's not the same Greek word, but it is a parallel thought, a synonym. That idea for letting it finish its work. Let the testing, let the challenge, let the stripping, let the pleading with God desperately, let that finish the working it's trying to do. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workings, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. There's a parallel. Sometimes God brings the testing to grow us up. The word character in Paul's vocabulary in the Greek, he chose a word that means having been proven. When the testing comes, we're going to see what we're made of. Now, some of you are like, oh, dice game again, right? Oh, crap. (laughs) Can I shift your perspective? Step back. We are hinging eternity on our relationship with Jesus. So why not hinge this life on our relationship with Jesus? Look around the room. No one's perfect here. Romans 3.23 reminds us all have fallen short of the glory of God. Let the testing come. Experience your shortcoming. Just be honest with the Lord about it. Oh, man, I was really impatient there. What's going on? Am I not getting enough sleep? Not eating enough? Spending too much time on I-25? Too much time at the Walmart return counter? Which there was actually no line yesterday. I was so excited. (laughs) And they were in great moods. Regardless, it's coming to make us stronger. That's a good thing. And we have to remind ourselves every day it's a good thing, regardless of what comes. So we've got some light issues. We've got some space issues in here today. If you felt yourself blood pressure going up, hey, we're safe. The air conditioner is actually kicked on. We're in chairs. We're not in the sun of Africa. We've got friends worshiping today. This is pretty good. There's not people with guns threatening to come in. It's a good day. A little light, a little movement. A little reshaping, big deal. Pfft. Small fries. Traffic, turn up the music. Right? You already know this, James says. Our perspective. Do you have the, the joy of growth or the fear of exposure? Because if you feel that paranoid fear of exposure, uh oh, here it comes. I'm not going to look very good. So what? Don't forget that when Jesus was on the cross for our sake, he was unclothed. That should have been our place. There's no greater exposure than up high on a cross without clothes on, dying in front of everyone. But he did it for us. Wow, that's grace. It's amazing. All right, God's perspective. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. Um, this idea of endurance, I, I wanted to read to you uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.3. It says endurance or perseverance or stick It's inspired by something. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, parallel with James. Our perseverance, our endurance, it's inspired by something. And Paul says it's the hope in Jesus Christ. That's your hope. It's not that, well, stock market's going to get better, gas prices are going to do this, or medical's suddenly going to be free, or whatever. 
regardless of how good or bad your life feels. Our hope's in Jesus. I had someone recently say to me, I may have shared this. They said, I'm stuck. There is no way out financially. I was on the phone. I start smiling. I wanted to rebuke him because I had the perspective, not as a jerk, but as a friend. But I didn't because they couldn't handle it at that time. I just said, all right, Lord, there's the moment. Have at it. Let's go. Man, what he did was awesome. He flipped the tables. Took about 48 hours. Free. Out of the situation. Awesome. Awesome. And if it doesn't come in the 48 hours, don't give up on God. He hasn't given up on you. He's the great physician. He's the great closer. All right. There's a reason these come. Here's one reason. This is Peter, 2 Peter 1, 4. These verses are not up there. In 1, 3, he says, His divine nature has given us everything we need. Everything we need, everything we need for two things, for life and for godliness. Okay? So don't play the woe is me, I'm not good enough for God, blah, blah, blah. Peter says, 2 Peter 1, 3, His divine power has given us everything we need to live life and to be godly. Why we do it? And then he says this in verse 4. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of this world. If you're minding your P's and Q's, walking with Jesus, you don't have to worry about being corrupted. It doesn't mean that you're not corrupted, but your eyes will be on him, not on being corrupted. What happened to Peter? Took his eyes off Jesus, noticed the other things going on. In fact, I posted this on Facebook because a guy said it, this Australian businessman. He said, we need to live between the boat and Jesus with our eyes on Jesus. And what does he mean? Because that is impossible to do unless Jesus helps us. Peter can't walk on water unless Jesus helps him. I mean, he just, there's the pool right there. Somebody want to give it a try? You can't do it. But in the midst of a storm, Jesus said, do it, Peter. And he did it. He did it. Now, Peter could have just said, oh, I'm scared. We'll stay in the boat. Because everybody was scared, right? These are, these are veteran fishermen. But it's a bad storm. Peter was a little off. Hey, I want to get out of the boat. I want, to walk, I want to walk on the stormy sea. We don't think about it like that. Well, Peter, you're just talking too soon, putting your feet in your mouth, peppermint socks, the whole deal. Nah, he had the courage. I want to do that. I want to do that. The thought of failing was not in his mind because he was looking at Jesus going, he's doing it, I want to do it. What a way to live. That's awesome. Romans 8, 11, the same, power that raised, same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. That's living in resurrection power. Every day's Easter for us. Oh, it's good news. All right, here's God's perspective. It's here somewhere. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. He, she. He or she. If any of you. Now, does my wisdom run out? Very quickly. I don't have a lot. There's worldly wisdom. There's some common sense things out there. Don't play ball in the street. Brady Bunch, mom always said, don't play ball in the house. Something's going to break. But God's wisdom's different. It's eternal. If you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to them. Now listen to this. You know these verses. I just hadn't realized this part. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Not doubt what? God has a better plan? That God will actually give it? That God's wisdom works? 
I think that's what it is. When you ask, because it says he gives generously to all without finding fault. I know it's about giving the wisdom. But I think it's actually, do we really believe that God has a better plan than we do? You need a case study? Here we go. Eve sees the apple. She's got a hankering that this apple can make her like God. She's heard that somewhere. You know what she should have done? And I, I have I never had this thought. God gave me this thought this morning. She should have, she go ahead and grab it. She should have paused and said, Lord, is eating this a good idea? What a game changer. What a cool thought. I can't come up with those. <laughs> That's God's idea. What if she would have grabbed the thing and said, Lord, is this a good idea? But she didn't. She actually doubted what God had said and went with what the serpent said. And it convinced her flesh that this was a great plan. Anybody want to tell about their great plans <laughs> that you have tried? And it was a mess. It was a royal mess. We are a royal mess. Yes. Lord, is this a good idea? I mean, and there are times I think the Lord says back, it's your choice. I trust you. You're not being self-centered about this. You're not being greedy about this. A or B, go for it. That's my personal opinion, my personal commentary. When he asks, we must believe and not doubt because... The one that doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Peter got to see those things. And then when he took his eyes off Jesus and put them on those things, what did he do? The doubt made him sink. Doubting God, doubting God always makes you sink. Every time. Every time. That person should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. They're unstable in other ways. We should have a place for those people. We do. It's called church. We've got a place. Let me ask you this. Is there a place at your table for people like that? Because at one time or another, you're that person, I'm that person. Do we have, do we have room at our table for people like that? That we can walk with them? That the Lord could actually work through us into someone else's life to give them the hope? to go another day. A friend of mine told me um, beginning of this week, good friend of his, just, they coached together, didn't show up. Administrators want to meet with the coaches. And he was thinking about taking his life. Drastic. But not uncommon. Not uncommon for this room. He's okay. He's getting help. But we never know what's behind the face we're looking at. We don't know how close to the edge someone is. Do we have room? Do we have time in our busy schedule, our important schedule for people? Do we have time? Do we have time with the Lord? Are we doubting? Yeah, it's, it's not worth it. CNN's better than that, or Fox News, or whichever one you go to. I don't care. Social media. Do you doubt that God's plan and wisdom is better than ours? 1 Corinthians 1 would say, the foolishness of God, of which there's not such a thing, but he's using hyperbole. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. And women. This is what wisdom looks like. It's gritty. It's, it's skill for living life while you walk with God. Wisdom is skill for living life while you walk with God. 
Lord, is, is, is eating this a good idea? Hey, Lord, is, is going that direction a good idea? I know you can see I can't. I'm just trying to get a sense here. Can I tell you that I grew up in the church? I burn out trying to live the way that church taught me to live. I really did. I ended up in the counsel, the therapist chair at 33 because I'd been doing ministry for, you know, since I was 16. And that brand of Christianity burned me out for Jesus. That is not the way to do it. Yeah, there's a grind. There's a push. There's an endurance. But there's a joy that you experience that you can't bottle. If we could, we'd be bajillionaires. Of walking closely with the Lord regardless of circumstances. Can I implore you? Ask for his wisdom. It might seem completely illogical what he asks you to do. But he does know what he's doing. I said it last uh, two weeks ago. The potter doesn't. The, the pot doesn't say to the potter, "You made a mistake." The watch doesn't say to the watchmaker, "What are you thinking?" The creation should never say to the creator, "Who do you think you are?" That sounds like our culture. Let me pray for us, Jesus. Just the fact that you put up with us. is actually more than we can ask or imagine. The scripture tells us you are long-suffering and that is what it's like to love us, I think. And we're grateful. Let us... Let us be that for others. Patient in love. Because your wisdom is amazing. We love you. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. And we're going to be reminded of the pillars of our faith as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. communion hymn this morning is the old rugged cross.
How many of you had to do errands this week? Anybody? Yeah. Neuro research tells us that we actually can't multitask. It makes us less efficient. Don't know if you knew that. We still try. Can you do all the errands at once? No. Got to wash the camel. I caught that from last week. It was good. That was good. I, I don't know if you do that, but that's funny. Got to wash the camel, vacuum. When we come to the table, we can get the feeling of, oh, Lord, where, where do I start? That's a devil trick. Don't let him do that to you. Pick one thing. God, I was selfish here. Got him doubting. God, I looked at that all wrong. I actually didn't wait for your perspective. Okay. See, you're already forgiven. We should have to learn how to walk in it. The grace is there. The grace is actually waiting. It was waiting before you got here today. That's the way Jesus works. His mercies are new every morning. It doesn't matter where you fail. So as you take the bread, I'll remind you of this. This was God's idea one day. When you hear it crack, just be reminded, sacrifice for us. Maybe it's cracking the shell of our heart or our thinking going, and it has to be everything at the same time. One thing. Just, just work on one thing, one step as we come to the table. Jesus, would you meet with us? You want to meet with us, sometimes we get afraid to meet with you. Because somewhere along our church lives, we've misunderstood who you are. You're so gracious. You're actually quite different than us. You're very gracious. You don't run out of patience. So you invite us to come. Even with the one who had already betrayed him, Jesus forgave. And he taught him to pray this way. Let's do that now. Our Father, who art in heaven,
And now let us give thanks. You've been sitting the whole time, so let's stand up, if you're able, all right? Easy benediction. Remind yourself of it all week. Make it a prayer. Here's our benediction. Ask for wisdom. Walk in wisdom, okay? Let's say it together on three. Ask for wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Be blessed. We're dismissed.